next year the administration has slated to reduce them. So when they were down from about 85,000 in 2016, um, last year they were about uh, 11,000. And we suspect that it will be even lower next year. And when they talk about these different refugee caps that they put in place, um, last year's there was 18,000. They let in about 11,000. They always under admit. So even if they say they're going to admit 15,000 or 12,000 or 10,000, you can guarantee the number that they actually will admit will be lower than that. So when they have these refugee caps, that's like the uppermost bound uh, for this administration in terms of admissions. If we all remember well, the main justification for reducing asylum, ending these programs was the national security fear. It was the fear that refugees, particularly uh, Muslim refugees uh, from the Syrian civil war or elsewhere, were a very serious terrorist threat to the United States. Um, but if you take a look at the numbers, you take a look at the number of people killed on U.S. soil from 1975 through the end of 2017 who were admitted as refugees. Um, there were only three people killed in terrorist attacks committed by a refugee on U.S. soil. And all of them were in the late 1970s. So that works out to an annual chance of being murdered in a refugee terrorist attack at about one in 3.8 billion per year. Um, very you know, small chance. It's not a consolation to the victims, of course, but it's a very small chance. And you compare that to the benefits of letting refugees in, and it just doesn't compare. To put that sort of in perspective, the annual chance of being murdered just in a normal homicide during that time period uh, is about one in 20,000 per year. So it's just a vastly different um, comparison. Now to asylum, I'm afraid it's even um, more depressing. The government has virtually shut down the asylum system um, on the Southwest border and put in place numerous restrictions and legal loops that asylees have to jump through um, in order to get um, asylum, you know, most spectacularly having to wait uh, in Mexico to the uh, MPP program for their court dates. So you have sort of this situation where there are essentially uh, refugee camps on the U.S. border um, uh, in Mexico. Of course, all that is a huge sham that is uh, intended to raise the costs and make it more difficult for people uh, to gain asylum. Now, moving on to the foreign worker categories, what the administration has done here is that in response to COVID-19, the government has essentially shut down every guest worker visa program in the United States, with the exception of the H-2A program, which is for um, seasonal agricultural workers who are almost the vast majority are from Mexico. Over, um, I believe it's over 95 percent are from Mexico. So those are the only ones types of workers who are really being admitted. And now um, this is enormously destructive to the U.S. economy. One example of this is, you know, many of us are able to keep our jobs because we're working remotely. And we're able to do that because of IT services provided. You know, we're able to have this Zoom call because of IT services, right? And if we didn't have these great services, it'd be much more difficult for us to work remotely. Um, and what we've seen is that H-1B workers, many of whom, the majority of whom work in computer occupations, um, many of them in IT services, have substantially lowered the price of supplying IT services to the U.S. economy. And as a result, millions of Americans likely are able to keep working um, because we have access to the skills provided by these workers. But it's not just high-skilled workers either. Um, to sort of make it personal for a lot of people, um, the government did end the J-1 visa for all pairs which is, you know, a, a temporary visa for somebody to come in from abroad to live in your home and to take care of your children. And, you know, this isn't a huge visa. It's not used by a huge number of people, but it is overwhelmingly used by higher skilled women, uh, you know, who are mothers who have jobs and careers. And this provides a great opportunity for them to both be mothers as well as to work. And the government has essentially ended this program. Um, so, you know, if my goal, and it's not my goal, but if my goal were to basically keep a lot of high skilled American women out of the labor force. When prior to the DACA program, 
I discovered my lack of immigration status upon graduating from high school. Uh, that was back in 2007. And thanks to the DACA program, I've been able to continue my advocacy efforts, uh, as well as returning to school and obtaining a master's degree, which is uh, kind of like the story that we see uh, across the board from 700,000 beneficiaries of this program. Uh, for the past number of years, DACA recipients have been contributing uh, to the United States, not just uh, through their taxes and their labor, but have been some of the most committed individuals to ensuring that uh, they, they, they represent you know, what is best of America, their families, their culture, and what they can become if they're given a chance to adjust their immigration status. Unfortunately, what we've seen from this administration has been nothing short of continued attacks on the DACA program. This past July, we saw a victory at the Supreme Court that allowed the DACA program to remain. Uh, but unfortunately, what we've seen now is that the administration has all intents of continuing to shrink the program to make it even harder for people to access it. Uh, as we're speaking right now, some of you may be familiar with the fact that the, that the administration through the Department of Home Security and ultimately through USCIS has issued guidance uh, to in, to cut the program in half, basically rendering uh, a benefit that is now active for only one year instead of two years, as it originally was stated, which means that the increase in fees, uh, $495, will now be doubled, uh, which is a significant barrier for a lot of beneficiaries, uh, especially, especially in rural communities and especially those who are currently navigating the, insta, the higher education system as uh, I once was, um, you know, I say all this to kind of paint the backdrop that what we've seen thus far is this relentless attack against this particular community, uh, short of a million individuals, but also no indication that there is any credible plan that wouldn't be tied to enforcement um, by the Trump administration or by uh, the Republican Party thus far. We have seen a majority of, we've seen a, a variety of different bills come and go, but none have essentially been given the green light uh, to kind of uh, circumvent uh, some of the, a lot of the, the roadblocks that we've seen, not just from the administration over in the executive at the White House, but also in the Senate, where Mitch McConnell has not given hearing to some of the other uh, pieces of legislation, so, so, such as the Dream and Promise Act. Um, that is obviously particularly concerning uh, for myself and also for a lot of people who have, um, you know, worked on this issue for a, a variety of different issues. I mean, for a variety of different periods of time. And I think what the panorama looks ahead for the DACA program specifically, um, at least in my view, is uh, under a second term of the Trump administration is the you know the potential repeal of the program with the threat that if you know the country or the democratic party does not accept higher immigration restrictions that you know this program would ultimately go away and the individuals uh currently benefit benefiting under it could be uh you know subjected to deportation um similarly uh you know we may see perhaps uh you know other proposals that include uh baking in uh, the, the the DACA program into, uh, you know, whatever plans uh, nefarious or otherwise the administration may have uh, to try to pass it through Congress and try to essentially use it as a bargaining chip for any other number of uh, policy issues that they may, uh, uh, that they may, you know, try to try to add to their uh, policy agenda during a second term. Uh, Again, and I cannot overstate this enough uh, because it feels that every time that the administration remotely says anything in, in a very, very difficult situation, should this president be reelected and uh, uh, successfully terminate this program. Uh, simultaneously, we also see uh, a lot of back and forth um, and, and it cannot be called anything but, you know, political theater when it comes to, you know, the uh, uh, the authorization of, of TPS for Venezuelans, uh, such as myself, my family and I arrived to the United States in the year 2000, uh, you know, from Caracas, Venezuela. And I think what you have seen 
thus far in Miami and in 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 Florida is essentially this uh, courting of the uh, small yet loud uh, voting block uh, of the Venezuelan American community uh, with little to no you know, with with some promise, but, you know, nothing really grounded in policy or reality that points to the potential authorization of the TPS program, given uh, the treatment of the program as a whole by other countries. So it'll be interesting to see how that develops under a second, you know, Trump administration. Uh, again, I'll, I'll attach my personal view. I, I don't think that, it, you know, it's a way forth. And anybody who believes that this president will do good by promises on immigration without trying to attach more restrictions uh, definitely needs to read up on, on the past four years uh, that, uh, of, of policy that we have seen um, from, from the White House and from Congress. Um, I'll end you know, by just kind of stating the, the other side. Obviously, uh, Joe Biden has essentially uh, uh, done a couple of things over the past number of months and, you know, even so weeks that indicate uh, a, a much more different approach than the one that the, 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 the Trump administration uh, would take under a second term. Number one is essentially the continuation of the DACA program, which uh, to a lot of people sounds like a good thing. Uh, however, it does not, you know, uh, uh, take us out of the fact that there are or there would be prob uh, likely additional legal challenges. Uh, uh, by by means of other attorney generals or potentially red states uh, to attack the program or continue to attack the program. Um, so it would essentially put the, the, the new administration potentially on a, on, on a position to try to pass something through Congress. What that would look like, you know, uh, I, I'd rather not dwell on speculation. Uh, and simultaneously is essentially the, the continuation of the TPS program and granting TPS for Venezuelans. Um, it does not, uh, and I think that this is worth, uh, worth noting, you know, the, the fact that the Obama and the Biden administration back, you know, from 2008 to 2012 really had a, uh, a very tragic record, uh, and destructive record in immigration when it comes to deportations. Uh, and it was, uh, somewhat refreshing seeing the vice, the former vice president acknowledging, uh, you know, uh, that record and, and, and trying to apologize for it. Only time will tell uh, what a Biden administration will ultimately end up doing. Uh, but the contrast couldn't be clearer, uh, given that uh, it was, you know, under uh, the Obama administration in 2012 that the DACA program was, uh, you know, conjured into existence. So uh, I think that we're obviously at a crossroads uh, when it comes to this issue, uh, as uh, Ali and, and, and Alex have mentioned, uh, you know, uh, things uh, definitely are looking much more difficult uh, for 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 the immigrant communities uh, that we have spoken about. Uh, much more so, obviously, under a second term uh, under President Donald Trump than you know if a change of administration were to happen. Uh, and I wouldn't be surprised if the amount of rule changing legislation and beyond uh, eats up a lot of their time and political capital. Uh, and it, it'll, it'll uh, it'll be telling where exactly the, the priority will fall so that we don't have to relive ever, uh, you know, the horror of having family separation or children break away from their parents and, and some of the other, um, you know, very damaging occurrences that we've seen uh, in years past. Thank you, Juan. Um